What do you guys think? Should we get started? Give a few more minutes. Get started. Get started? Okay. Great. Um, hello. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, my name is Dana Tortorici. I am the co editor in chief of N Plus One. Um, N Plus One is a little magazine of literature, culture, and politics published three times a year. Uh, we have a new issue out actually right now called Take Care. If you want to support N Plus One and the stuff that we do, which includes um, events like this, you can subscribe to the magazine at www.nplusonemag, all spelled out, dot com, slash subscribe. Uh, the link is now in the chat. And if you use the discount, discount code take care, all one word, you can get 20% off. So we recommend that you do that. Um, you can also donate. We have a recommended donation of $5 for events like this. Um, there's a donate link. Thank you, Lisa. And most important of all, please, please, please support us and Christine by buying her wonderful book, Life of the Mind, which we are talking about tonight in the N plus one shop. Um, so that is also in the chat. So as I mentioned, I'm Dana. I am co-editor in chief of N plus one. With me tonight is Charles Peterson, my co-editor, uh, senior editor of N plus one, and of course, Christine Smallwood, the author of this book. Um, Christine is a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine and a contributing editor at Harper's Magazine. She has a PhD in English from Columbia University and The Life of the Mind is her first novel. She's also a longtime contributor to N Plus One. Uh, so to kick things off, I'm going to pass it to Charles to introduce the book um, and ask Christine about where it all began. Awesome. Thanks, Dana. Um, yeah, this is really exciting. Um, so the book. Um, you know, we decided that I was going to give some kind of overview of the book because we're not going to, we're not going to have a reading probably, um, because we feel like we have a lot to get through. And also Dana felt like if she, um, described the book, she would inevitably give spoilers. So hopefully I won't do that. Um, so it's, you know, it's a novel, um, that's set in New York. Um, it's about an adjunct, um, someone who is, has finished her PhD. Her name is Dorothy. Um, and she's struggling to kind of uh, launch an academic career or perhaps come to terms with the failure to launch an academic career. Um, and she's also had a miscarriage. The, the novel starts with her miscarriage on the first page, um, or at least with, with kind of the aftermath of the miscarriage. Um, and it's definitely, I think the, the title is apt. It is about the life of the mind, but also about um, a woman who's kind of coming to terms with the connection between her mind and her body and um, you know, the disconnections thereof. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, um, it's an incredibly exciting novel. I hope some of you have seen the reviews. It's been really well received. And I think, um, you know, it's the, the beginning of a great career. Um, so Christine, can you tell us uh, how, you know, how you came to write this, you know, what your relationship with N plus one is and yeah. Um, well, my relationship with N plus one is that I have written for N plus one. <laughs> um, I think I, the first things I wrote for N plus one were for the website about like Britney Spears and the Babies movie, I think. And then um, wrote some things for N1FR with the wonderful Scott Hamra as editor. And um, then when I started to write fiction, which I did not start to do really until I was in my 30s, um, N plus one was um, a place that published two of my first short stories. Um, one was called Hand Jobs and one was called Stewards. And um, so after that, so right now I'm talking about where the book came from. Um, so I had this, um, I was trying to write a collection of short stories, um, but most of them were really bad. And there were only a couple that um, were like halfway decent and or good or whatever. And um, and around that time, Charles, you asked me if I had any other fiction to send you. And so I sent you the story, The Keeper, which I had written thinking it was just a short story. Um, and then when then I was still trying to write short stories that were not going very well. And then it seemed like everybody thought that that was already part of a novel in progress. So I decided I would just like see what would happen and kind of pick it up and it eventually became this book. Cool, yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny because when we, when we got this story, I remember the editorial board kind of feeling like, we just discussed it as if it were the beginning of the novel. Um, we didn't have any sense that it was a self-contained story. Um, and yeah, and, and part of the feeling was like, can this, can this stand alone as a story? 
Um, we felt like it could, but we were also, you know, excited about where it was going to go. So that was that was definitely a surprise to us after the fact that, yeah. that we thought of it as a story. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I don't know why it took so long, you know, because there was a couple of years in between when I wrote that story and then when I actually went back to it. Um, I clearly wasn't, you know, ready or prepared to actually deal with it as a novel. I remember a friend of mine, when the story came out, his feedback to me was that he thought it felt unfinished. <laughs> And I was like, oh, you think a story about a miscarriage is unfinished? I was like really offended. But then that kind of like stayed with me and kind of haunted me and it was unfinished, it turned out. Um, that is a funny story, good friend. Um, <laughs> but being unfinished is very much the theme of one of the themes of the novel. Right. Um, and I wanted to ask you actually about um, the type of miscarriage that Dorothy, the protagonist, has, um, because it's it's almost oblique in The Keeper. There is a reference to the word blighted, and then later in the novel, um, it gets into a little more detail, but still not. And I realized that maybe a lot of people don't know what a blighted ovum is. And I wanted to know if you could actually just describe what that is and what, what the kind of miscarriage it is that Dorothy has, because it's not a spoiler and it, um, kind of sets up, it's like a metaphor for her academic career and her life as well. So can you explain what that is for the- Yeah, so that? she has a first trimester miscarriage when she, um, you know, she gets pregnant and she takes like an at-home pregnancy test and um, it's pregnant. And then she goes to the doctor for like a, a sonogram and like a first checkup, which happens at like eight weeks. And at that time, there, the, um, the sonogram shows that the embryo is not developing into a fetus, right? And so um, at that point, um, it's not clear if that's because maybe the timing of the visit is wrong and actually maybe she got pregnant later than she thought she did. So she needs to come back and have it verified that this embryo is actually not developing. And then that's called a blighted ovum. And then usually the body um, will sort of just spontaneously hemorrhage to evacuate that what is like a not viable pregnancy. Um, but there are cases, uh, as in Dorothy's case, and um, where the body just doesn't do that, is just kind of holding onto it. And then at that point, they give you a choice, which is either to have like an in-office DNC or to take um, Cytotec at home to begin kind of um, the contractions that will, you know, get the pregnancy out. Does that explain it? It does. And like the sort of extended metaphor component is the what actually what you explained to me about um, the genetic material in the egg, like the reason it doesn't develop is like yeah. there's not the stuff, but it, everything else happens. So like the environment for an embryo to develop is, is present, but not the thing itself. And you set it up without not in such a handed, heavy handed way as I'm describing, but you set it up as sort of Dorothy sees it almost as a symbol of what's going on with her academic career. And I wanted to know if you could talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. So like, I mean, the thing about the blighted ovum is that you're, you're chemically pregnant, like your body thinks you're pregnant. Um, but and so like your blood test comes back showing like a lot of pregnancy hormones, but there's just been a kind of, yeah, the genetic material. Often it happens in a case where there's like a trisomy or some other abnormality. And so it's just like, it's not gonna be a good, it just doesn't go anywhere, right? And so that's the kind of idea of the academic career being itself a kind of blighted ovum where it's like there's certain trappings around it, but like actually this is, what did Charles say before, like a failure to launch? Mm -hmm. Like there's something in here that isn't going to develop in the way that we think it should. And then in the book, in the beginning of the book, um, Dorothy has sort of thoughts about you know, what is like a life, what do, you, what do you even call a life that isn't developing? And I mean, in the book is, you know, obviously making like a reference to like, this isn't like a, a buildings roman or something. This isn't like a plot where there's going to be development as the structure. There's going to be actually like non-development as the structure. So I think that th throughout the book, you make what to me, scan as jokes, um, but are maybe like a little too high concept to be jokes, but there are sort of like jokes about non-development and the kind of book that this is not going to be. Um, so one example is 
uh, at one point, some of the characters go to an underwater puppet show where Dorothy is reflecting on the nature of this sort of senseless Fantasia of like shapes underwater. And she kind of like learns to accept that she's sort of suspended in this like non-narrative yeah. situation. And it's kind of like, that's kind of sort of what sort of novel we're in a little bit. It's like her free floating experience. And then various jokes um, about academics who different, do different kind of work um, including one professor who I have to actually just read exactly what it is. It's not as funny if I paraphrase it. Um, but there is a scene at an academic conference where the fancy professor, maybe you know it off the top of your head since you wrote it, Christine. Do you know it? No, I don't remember. You don't remember? It was, it's something about like the political, he, he works on, um, the episodic as uh, something with like radical political. Oh yeah, I just found it because I have a PDF here. Do you want me to say what it is? Yes, please. So um, a theory that emphasized the episodic as a virtue with radical political utility rather mm -hmm. than a failure to achieve continuity or coherence. So this is like one of what I perceived to be like many jokes in the book about the kind of book that this is. Um, were those conscious? Were they meant to be tongue in cheek? Did you have fun writing them? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All of that is on purpose. <laughs> okay, great. They worked. I liked them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I also, there are definitely, there are laugh lines in the book. Um, and there are also, there are lots of moments of self, of, of kind of reflexivity. Um, I mean, so Christine was a book reviewer for a long time, has written like great essays for The New Yorker, Harper's, N Plus One. Um, and one of the, one of my favorite tricks and kind of the tricks of, of many book reviewers is you take a quote from the book that kind of describes the book itself. Um, and it's, it's always helpful because you, you have like both kind of the authority of the book. Um, it's like, you know, the author themselves said, this is what it's like. And then you also have the words that give some kind of description. Um, and I don't know how much, how self-conscious you were about this, but I feel like this is a book that, um, that is kind of self-describing throughout, throughout the entire narrative. Um, one instance is that you say, um, this is kind of the Dorothy's reflecting on the, um, the puppet show, the underwater puppet show and says, um, you know, it's a gentle ongoing state of ups and downs that contain moments of illusory transcendence and ult ultimately built to nothing no epiphanies or so many epiphanies that they ran together and were forgotten. Um, and weirdly, I think that this book is actually, it's the latter. I mean, there's kind of endless kind of, you know, perfect lines. Um, and, and yet that doesn't necessarily make for a narrative. Um, it does, you know, it doesn't make for the kind of the traditional narrative that we expect. Um, and yet, like, I wondered about this question of, of humor because, um, and this is something you and I, Christine, have talked about, is like some people read the novel and kind of think, find it laugh out loud funny, and there are moments like that. Um, and yet, and I, like, I at least, I didn't experience it as a comic novel, and you and I share the experience of having gotten PhDs, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, and so there are moments where... I kind of wondered how much people were laughing at kind of the academy and thinking that this was like blown out of proportion. And I was, at least for me, it's just like, oh no, that's just all too realistic. Um, yeah, yeah. So how, like, how do you think about humor in the novel? Well, I think that Dorothy is an incredibly vulnerable character. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the way that we're privy to her thoughts, like we're hearing her think things that I think are kind of cringy. Right. I mean, so there's there's like certainly like some kind of physical comedy about the body and the, and the but I think I think what people find funny is the sort of it's not just the bleakness of the academic context. It's her sort of like the cringy, embarrassing things that she says. And um, so that's what I mean, I think it's that humor. There's humor and vulnerability and then there's humor in the sort of like tragedy and the sort of like bleakness of that. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm getting like a lot of different kinds of feedback about the book and I, I definitely find some people find it more depressing and some people find it funnier. Um, it does seem that people who are more in the academy and find it more depressing and people who are outside of it find it funnier. What do you, where do you land on it? Me? Yeah. Um, I, um, it's interesting. It's like, I, I definitely wasn't trying to be funny. Um, but I was trying to be like, like I was trying to write about the things that seemed the most potentially embarrassing to me and the most potentially shaming to me. And I do think that 
is what makes things funny when you really just like put everything out there. Um, and so there are parts that like I find funny when I read it out loud. I don't think I'm supposed to say, can you say your own writing? Is funny? <laughs> sure, why not? I don't know if you can even say that. Yeah, you can. Why not? I made a good joke. Um, I'm glad that people think it's funny. You know, that's good. What so, was oh, sorry, go ahead. What was drawing you to toward those kind of those moments of shame? Like why was that the the impulse? You know, I thought a lot about why I felt so compelled that I like had to write a book that would be like so shaming. I think it has something to do with um the shame around writing itself. You know, like I think, you know, there's one way you could read the book and say that all of this bleeding is like a form of writing, right? And you could kind of, you have this main character who is ostensibly a writer, right? I mean, she's an academic, so she's supposed to be writing her book. But of course, we never see her doing anything like that, right? Instead, we see her, her body kind of bleeding inappropriately, like in a way that's not controlled, in a way that's not planned, right? It's like she's not actually like sitting down to the desk and writing. It's like sometimes she goes to the bathroom and like there's blood or a blood clot or a lump or whatever that she wasn't necessarily expecting. Um, and so like, I do think like throughout the book, there are also all these like little references to writing and um, like printing, like there's like printing problems. You know, there's like, um, the only kind of successful printing in the book is when the doctor hands her a picture, a sonogram of her like empty uterus. Like that's the, the document that we get printed out. And we don't even really know what she's trying to print in the library. This probably doesn't make sense if you haven't read the book. Um, but my point is that I think like writing is very shameful, um, bleeding is very shameful, academia is very shameful, and I, for whatever reason, just felt compelled to like run towards all of those sources of shame. How did you work through them as you were writing? Were there times where you wanted to turn your face away from them and you're like, I can't deal, or were you worried? I mean, there is an, another joke about the book um, is when the with the podcast, there is a therapist who is has a podcast one of dorothy's therapists starts a podcast um and there is a sort of joke about which of her patients become episodes right <laughs> and one of the sort of running jokes is that like not all of her patients are, are um sympathetic um <laughs> and like their problems are not sympathetic and one of the things that comes up when you're writing a book like this and especially a book that like runs toward things in your in your experience that are shameful is like is this sympathetic was that something you struggled with at all or definitely I definitely struggled with the sense of like is this story about I I do think it's a story about precarity but I also you know like Dorothy is a white woman Dorothy's the version of precarity that Dorothy is dealing with is not like the most precarious of precarities and so like I certainly felt anxiety about telling that story, how to tell that story, how self-consciously to tell that story. And um, so that a little bit is what that line is about for me, like how sympathetic is this person really? And of course, like intellectuals are often not very sympathetic or like the problems of a professors are often not treated with a lot of sympathy outside of that sort of closed world of the academy. Um, I mean, in terms of like, how do you, I mean, how do you deal with any like writing project that isn't always going well? You just like feel terrible. <laughs> it's just like you're just abject, you know. You you come home from wherever you've been working. Like in my case, um, sometimes like at first there was like a writing space that had no heat, and then there was like the public library, and then eventually there was a sort of like normal writing space. But you just come home and you're like, well, I had another terrible day of like you know wasting my life on this shit that no one will read. And yet. And here we are <laughs> at this Zoom <laughs> book event. Zoom <laughs> <laughs> event. How does it feel to be on the other side? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess like the way it always feels when you finish something, you're just kind of like, oh, okay, that's that's over now. <laughs> There's no sense of pride. You're not like I read a good book. Do you feel pride when you finish something? <laughs> no, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can we talk about the the um, the climate change element of the book? Uh, we didn't really talk about that the other day when we were talking about the book, but um, there are also references to Revelations, Judgment mm -hmm. Day. Um, there's this kind of like personal Dorothy bodily subplot and then this sort of world historical global mm -hmm. um, 
maybe we are in a time that is the end of something. Mm -hmm. um, kind of how did that figure into the book? How central was it for you? Well, yeah, I mean, it was, it was important to me. I mean, the, so bringing together, there's kind of like three tiers of endings in the book. There's the miscarriage, and then there's the academic career, and then there's the whole world, right? And I'm definitely like wanting to give her, I mean, I think those thoughts are pretty common now, right? Like, what does it mean that the world is ending? But because of the nature of the blighted ovum miscarriage, in which, and because of the nature of Dorothy's specific bleeding, which was like, it didn't, she didn't just like miscarry and then it was over within the like, you know, expected number of days. There continue to be these kinds of like odd eruptions of bleeding. Um, that sort of sense of like, when will this be over? Like, why isn't this over yet? I thought this was gonna end, it's not end. And my, I was sort of after, you know, after I finished the book, I was like, oh gosh, I wonder if people will still be living in this kind of temporality. But then we had the election, right? Which I think was exactly this kind of temporality of like an ending that wouldn't end. And there does seem to be like, that's the time that we live in now, you know? And that's the time of climate crisis, which is like, it's already happened for these people. It's, ha it's happening for these people. Like it's, it's always already going on now. Yeah, I kind of, um... It occurred to me looking at the book again today um, and thinking somewhat about kind of your past relationship with M plus one. Um, so like one of the earliest things you did with the magazine was that you're on this panel about um, evangelicals. Oh yeah. Very, very long time ago with Malcolm Gladwell among others. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, I hope I, it's not, it's okay that I out you as having kind of a, even, you know, something of a Christian yeah, background, right? I was right? raised in evangelical. Um, and, a and there are definite like, I mean, I was raised with a Christian background and like there are, you know, you're kind of quoting parts of the Bible, you're talking about the apocalypse. Yeah. And it occurred to me that, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the biggest frame here that's kind of left out but is implicit is like death <laughs> itself, yeah. you know. Um, and, and in some ways I wondered whether, um, you know, it's kind of convenient that we have this, you know, th this sense of like world historical apocalypse because it's, a, it's for, if, you're, if you're a secularized Christian, it's an easy way to displace like your past sense of like of death and everything and to make it like just socially normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but without the, the hope of salvation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I see Dorothy and I think this is, I think this is seeded throughout the book. Um, but you know, as someone who was raised Christian and like replaced her faith with literature and then has lost that too. Right. And so she just has nothing now. Right. And so this this compensation she had for the loss of her faith is now also turning into a form of suffering. She's lost that because she can't get a job or because like. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. It's just like, you know, you like she went into that to escape from something else. And now that has become its own kind of dead end. And yet this novel exists that supposes right. that perhaps literature is still salvation. Well, and as a character, she's constantly like thinking about books. Like she's clearly a reader and is deeply invested and in, like she sees the world through the kind of lens of literature. But I, there's a kind of like taste of ashes in her mouth, you know? Yeah. I wanted to talk about the academia part a bit um, and about what was the conscious choice you told me to not um, to not include sort of like male rivals or male villains in the academic subplot. I think it like produces obviously very interesting characters and dynamics that are maybe underrepresented in literary novels. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about how you developed those characters and why you made that choice to not include men? Right, yeah. So it's funny because I actually, didn't, it wasn't conscious. And when I gave my husband the like draft to read because he didn't, nobody like read anything until I had like a completed draft. And he was like, oh, I love that you've written this book where it's, it's like a world of women, like except this one boyfriend character. And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> you know? And then I had to like think about why I had done that. Did I want to do that? Should I make changes at that point, you know, and kind of, um, but thinking now about like, why doesn't Dorothy have a male mentor? I mean, so I am going to sort of take the like circuitous personal route to that, which is that when I was in graduate school, I only worked with men. Hmm. 
and I had um, some pretty like not great experiences. I was sexually harassed by one professor, and then when I tried to like get help from other professors, I was not really helped. And um, and so for me, when I look back on like why didn't I want to pursue an academic life, there is a kind of open question of like what would what would have happened if I had had a female mentor? Like, would I actually have wanted to stay in academia? And I don't think the answer is yes, but it's still like an open question for me. And I did not want that to be a question for the reader about yeah. Dorothy, right? So like when it came time to like decide, okay, am I going to keep this mentor a woman or make her into a man? I just think that if, if she had a male mentor, the only way that it would have been a kind of abusive relationship would have been to make it a kind of me too situation. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to write a me too book. And I didn't want the reader to close the book and say, oh, if only she had had a female advisor, everything would have been different. So I wanted to give her the like possibility of a female to identify with and then take that away. That makes a lot of sense. And also I think, uh, tell me if this was true for you, but, um... I do wonder if in the academy people tend to compete in silos of like, it's a very competitive environment because there are, there's like a scarcity of resources and there is the only time you really learn that um, Dorothy has written a dissertation or started to write a dissertation um, is by learning that Judith is her dissertation advisor. Um, and when you introduce and when she's introduced, it's like dissertation advi advisors like parents have favorites. Um, and so there is, there are always there's sort of like canalized competition um, between people. And sometimes it is like as the children of one or like the acolytes of one mm -hmm. advisor. But do you think that people in the academy tend to compete, like choose their competitors, like identify like, like people to be like just, on gender I, lines or like subject lines or whatever? I do think so. And I also think that has to do with the way that often in academia, subject positions or identity positions kind of line up with areas of study. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't always happen, but it does seem to happen a lot. And so if you're all competing for jobs in a certain field or a certain subfield, you might find yourself competing against someone who is like your gender, maybe. I don't want to make such a gross generalization because I'm sure the participants here would have many counterexamples. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and I also think, I mean, I want to say something else about her work. Is it okay if I just sort of ramble a little bit? Of course, bit? go off, yeah. But it's like, so we're told that Dorothy's dissertation is on female confinement, which would suggest that she has a kind of feminist project, but then we don't like know anything else about that. So that's just like a kind of another place where there's a little bit of a black box, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it's none of her, none of her references or allusions seem right. to be about that. And it seems to speak to her confusion about what her thing is and what her subject is and her like failure to market herself. Yeah. Right. And just a kind of failure to like fit into the program in some way. Yes. Can you, yeah. oh, sorry, I wanted to, I wondered if you were cool talking about how you came up with Judith, because I thought that was a cool story. Oh, yeah. So when I was working on the book, um, it was not going well. And um, then the Avital Ronell scandal hit the news. And I was like, I'm gonna write a TV pilot about a sort of Avital Ronell type academic. <laughs> and I'm gonna just, this book is just done and I am done with it and I'm just gonna ch change my life. And so I wrote this TV script and um, it had this character, Judith, in it. And, um, and she was, um, a bright spot and I think an otherwise kind of like uneven TV script. And then when I kind of was like trying to figure out what to do once I realized that my TV pilot wasn't gonna change my life, I had this kind of epiphany where I was like, oh, I just like wrote this character that can go in my book. Like this is one of Dorothy's like antagonists. And so she, you know, obviously then there were changes that were made, but that's kind of where she was born. That's cool. <laughs> Charles, did you I, uh, well, I, um, yeah, I think one of the, I mean, the book is about an adjunct. Um, it's about adjuncts. It's about women. Um, it's about the university. And yet, like you're saying, so there's not, and, and she's writing this feminist book. Um, and yet feminism is kind of absent. Similarly, um, you know, I've written a lot about kind of the, the struggles of adjuncts in the labor market and, um, and 
uh, the, the rise of grad student unions and things like that. And yet, and that's also kind of not, not what the novel is about. Mm -hmm. And I think there would be a kind of a simplistic reading of the novel. It's like, she just needs to read the right things. She just needs to get involved in her union. Mm -hmm. um, and at some level that might be right. I mean, maybe we should all just join our unions. Um, <laughs> plus one, we, we recommend you join your, your local union. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I wondered, I mean, that it seems like that's where kind of the narrative comes from is precisely that she doesn't have those, those possibilities. But I was wondering, you know, um, about the place of work and kind of comradeship and things like that in the novel. Yeah, well, certainly there is no comradeship or camaraderie. I mean, like, so as a critic, I tend to do this thing when I'm reading a book where, you know, I'll be like, well, we only know what we know right we only know what we're given and like these characters really don't exist outside of these particular situations that they're in like we can say very little about them there was this time in grad school where i was doing this like coding project and we were it was like a we were teaching the computer how to understand aesop's fables and like we had to like assign motives to characters and there was one other student there were many of us doing it but another of the students another of the student was assigning like a zillion motives to every character and like breaking the program <laughs> And I was like, actually, we don't know why the crow is in the tree. Like, who can say? And I was like, not assigning any motives to anything. And we both were like, yelled at. We were like, you know, told that we had to like, you know, assign some like normal number of motives to things. Um, but all which is a long way of saying that like, who is Dorothy outside of this miscarriage? I don't think we really know, right? Like, um, what are Dorothy's relationships like? I'm not in this like you know, few week period that this book takes place. Like, is the miscarriage the source of all of these affective problems she has? Like, is she depressed because of the miscarriage or is she just like depressed? You know, is she just abject all the time? And um, I, I mean, I wrote this book and like, I don't know. And maybe, I don't know what that means. Like, I don't know if I'm supposed to know, but I guess I'm just not that interested. And so like, you know, you think about her relationship with Gabby, you know, and I've heard that's her best friend. And I've heard, you know, and maybe in earlier drafts, the book was different too, but people would be like, what kind of friends are these? And I'm like, they're best friends. Like Gabby is her best friend and they love each other. It's just that Dorothy is in a period of being super withholding, of refusing care, of hiding from people, you know, like of not asking for help, of not getting help, of not making connections, you know? But like, what is she like with Gabby when she doesn't have a secret miscarriage? Who can say? Who can say? Yeah, no, I, I actually noticed that was the the juxtaposition of like the the privilege the reader has of access to Dorothy's thoughts really makes Gabby look like a terrible friend and in general makes the people around Dorothy look kind of bad. Um, mm -hmm. because we know what she's going through and she is withholding from them. Um, but it really clarifies like what a sort of um awful thing it is to do to it really makes you really in your own mind make your friends look really bad when you don't give them an opportunity to be compassionate or helpful to you when you like let them continue to like blather on about being the protagonists of your shared relationship um because gabby comes off as like kind of selfish and like obnoxious and mm -hmm. glib um but in the moments where Dorothy sort of slips or seems to intuit that something has happened or is going on, she's very interested and curious. Um, yeah. And maybe not enough, but she's, you yeah. get the impression she could be a, a better friend. Dorothy could be a better friend? No, that um, Gabby, Gabby could be a better friend if Dorothy like told Let her literally anything. Yeah, I mean, and I think that you, you, you know that Dorothy loves Gabby because she cares for her. And I'm not gonna like explain what happens in the book, but there is a kind of like, plot event involving Gabby where, I mean, I read it as Dorothy like giving Gabby care that she cannot accept for herself. But, um, but that is like a true moment, I think, of friendship. Even if, it, even if Dorothy is making judgments about Gabby, even if she's like doing something she doesn't really wanna do, but she's doing it because it's her friend, you know? And um, yeah, I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, but I wanted to say something about privacy. So like, I think that the, you know, Dorothy's thing is about privacy and like, that's what she really wants is like interiority and privacy. And so the reader has this like hyper intimate relationship with her because the reader, like you're saying, is the one who's like getting everything that's going on that nobody else is getting. But we're also told that like, this is like what she wants in her romantic life too, right? Like she wants her, she loves her boyfriend because he leaves her alone. 
<laughs> you know, because he like respects some like core of her person where like things can be like sacred and private. And, you know, I do think this thing about like sharing, right? Like we live in a world of sharing and like on the one hand, Dorothy is withholding. On the other hand, why does she have to tell Gabby what happened? Right? I mean, she, we're, we're, le we're meant to think that she should have told somebody because it's obviously really messing with her and she's like really depressed and upset about it. But I do think that the book is sort of like playing with letting how much, you, how much the narrator can like let Dorothy have and like what are the things that we know and don't know about Dorothy. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking the other day when we met, like we don't know anything about Dorothy's work. Mm -hmm. Right? And like my reading of that is that like that is like the ultimate shame. Right, the like if to actually like go into the content of someone's dissertation in a novel, like I couldn't do it. You know what you I mean? Like I, try. I could write. I just couldn't even bring myself to try. Like I could write a book where someone like opens with somebody like taking a shit, and there's like uterine stuff and like menstrual stuff and like all of that I could do. But I was like, I actually cannot. <laughs> I cannot do like a literature dissertation. It's One of these days, I'm actually going to read your dissertation, Christine, and we'll have to deal with that. You can download it. I mean, I like, know, it's, it's the out there. Thing. They make you do that. Otherwise, <laughs> they don't give you your degree. I remember when I had to sign the paper, I was like, what do you mean this is public? And they're like, you don't get your degree if you don't do this. Blackmail. Like, who does that? <laughs> the university. Um, can I ask, ask you? Oh, sorry. I was going to oh, ask a craft go ahead. about about kind of what it was like to move from writing to short stories to writing novels. And there are, there are scenes in the novel that feel, you know, the way that we're talking about this, like you'd really think there's no plot in this novel, but there is, there is. And there are char there's character development, like there are people, like it's not like, it's not like incredibly avant-garde. No, um, it's not. It's yeah. totally not, no. And so, and you know, especially like kind of closer to the end too, there's like a, a wonderful party scene with a karaoke part and there's a lot of there's the great like academic conference set piece um so i was curious about how you kind of got into that after story writing and also if there are particular passages that were very fun or easier for you to write versus like more difficult that you had to like slog through yeah um so i think that i like i think the hardest thing about trying to write a novel is trying to figure out how to structure it and like, how, how is time gonna work in your book, right? Like, cause really it could work in any number of ways. You could write a whole novel that takes place in one hour, you know, or it could take place in a hundred years. And the solution that I came up with was to structure the book according to the bleeding. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm, I mean, maybe this is not obvious. I mean, I had a, a blighted of a miscarriage. And so I just, and I had sort of, noted down like the sort of bleeding events of my blighted open miscarriage and just gave the book that temporal structure and so it was like I knew that you know like it was it was going to be this day and then the next day and then you know the ob -GYN appointment had to be this many days later and then you know the lump had to be this many days later and then it was just kind of about like figuring out what else could happen on those days and that was like a ballast for me and because it kind of solved a lot of otherwise huge open-ended questions about like, what should a chapter cover? <laughs> How much time happens in a chapter? You know, like the questions that are really, really difficult. Um, and then, you know, I think that like the Las Vegas part was really fun to write. Um, the hardest thing to write was the first chapter because I mean, originally that was like twice as long mm -hmm. and, uh, just like getting that to a place where it was both the kind of dump of interiority that I wanted it to be, but where I didn't lose everyone who was reading, that was a really hard challenge. Because for a while I was like, oh, this should be super long. It'll be like a hemorrhage, like a verbal hemorrhage. And it'll be like this like formal experiment. And then early readers were like, yeah, nobody gets that. They <laughs> must stop reading. <laughs> So kind of like cutting that down, but still keeping that sense of being like really claustrophobically in her head was hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of feel like there is something experimental about the novel. Um, like in that, so like on, you, you write, um, this is again from the, uh, the ever generous um, regenerative underwater puppet show moment. You write, <laughs> we love it. <laughs> in matters of aesthetics, she was a Philistine, a slave to bourgeois narrative conventions. She believed characters mattered, events. Um, and there are characters and events in the novel. And yet uh, I think what makes it, what made it feel 
you know, different from most other realist novels is how much you, you do follow her into her head. Mm -hmm. um, like you're really willing to go on for like a long space without doing like what, what like Bart calls like the reality effect where you kind of refer to like, oh, the subway door opened or someone entered. Um, and that in itself, even though it is kind of, it's narrated in a, in a realist manner, um, that felt like very exciting and different and adventurous to me. Um, because like, you know, it's just, uh, it felt realistic in that people really do get lost in their heads, especially in the subway. Like you miss your subway stop for a reason. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, I kind of wondered how you, how you arrived at that style. Cause that felt like a big decision. I don't really know. I don't know if that was a choice or not. I think that might've just been how the book came out. And I think that, you know, when I wrote this story, um, the voice of the narrative like arrived fully formed. And so the challenge wasn't like to find that voice, it was to not lose it. And so like at various points, you know, I'd be like, oh, I've kind of like gotten really far from what that was. And so because, I guess just because the story was so like interior and in her head, every time I felt kind of confused about what to do, I just returned to that place and liked being there. Can I ask about abortion? Yeah. So, um, sorry, I always want to spoil things. Christine and Charles had to hear me rant yesterday about how I believe that spoilers don't spoil. If you have an imagination. Um, so obnoxious. Uh, but um, there is something in the novel that sort of um, brings up, like, the within this milieu, like, within Gabby and um Dorothy's milieu there seems to be more shame or taboo or like lack of fluency socially about um miscarriage than there is about abortion um and this seems sort of like an inversion one would think of how we were raised to think and talk about abortion mm -hmm. um and I wondered and there's like just a very fleeting reference to Dorothy being brought to like carry around like pro-life signs at a rally um, when she's a teen. And I was curious about how you thought about abortion in relation to miscarriage in the book and for Dorothy personally. Yeah, so this comes up right away when Dorothy is first sort of thinking about the miscarriage and you know, thinking about how it is the same um, what she does, you know, taking the cytotech at home to um, start the contractions to... And that's misoprostol, right? Is that how right. you're using them? It's the same drug. Yeah. Um, it's the same drug that you do to have a, a medical abortion, right? And so from the very beginning, like, the procedure of the miscarriage looks exactly like the procedure of an abortion. Um, but, like, everything about it is different for her. And so like, I was really interested in just like that, like what does it mean to have this thing that's like administratively the same, but is like felt in such a different way. And I mean, I think the thing about abortion in our sort of milieu is that it is just like a choice and we feel really good about choices. And we really like to think of ourselves as people who make choices in all kinds of ways. Like we're Asians, we're autonomous, we're choosing like, and, um, and, you know, Dorothy has this stuff about like controlling time, you know, an abortion is saying like, I don't want to be a mother now, maybe I'll be a, mo a mother later, but like, I'm kind of like a master of, of time. And a miscarriage is something that happens to you. It's passive. It's like, it's, it's nobody's fault. And yet a lot of people feel, feel that it is somehow like a, a judgment on them or their fertility or their maternity or their like fitness to kind of like carry a life. Um, and you know, I think I'm always really interested in experiences that aren't choices and that don't feel like choices and situations where subjectivity is experienced as being really attenuated or in some ways like diminished. And so for me, the miscarriage was just like a really like rich area to explore that. And then in the particular case of Dorothy and how she thinks about the miscarriage, I think it also exposes some like cultural ambivalences we have around early pregnancy. And I felt this when I was pregnant. Um, I have two children, I have two sons. And when I was pregnant with my first son and noticing the way that women I knew would kind of like display their sonogram 
photos like on their refrigerators or share them on social media like their, their first sonogram photo the like earliest one and I was always like yeah I mean the last time I saw sonogram photos I was literally carrying them at the pro at the pro-life walk and like I don't um I don't know how to really think about that except as a kind of like area where like we're not really sure what we think about what that is what that early pregnancy is um, and so it just it became interesting for me to like write about it. I don't know if you remember this, but we actually talked about it at one point as something you might write an essay about. Yeah. I think it's much better in the book. I think it's cooler in the book. And you have that amazing passage from the magic, is it from the Magic Mountain? Yeah. Um, where Hans Kostorp is looking at the x-ray. So good. Yeah, it's like when you're looking into the body. Yeah. Looking at stuff you're like maybe not supposed to see. Yeah. Um, Can you tell us about the um, the toilet? Yeah, I was gonna oh, say. The behind me. Yeah. So, hold on, let me. So I am. Um, so my book begins on a toilet. Um, there's a lot of toilets in it, and um, <laughs> this is a photograph that I took in 2014. So two years before I started writing any of this, um, at the NYU Bobst Library. Um, and I don't know if you can see, but there's this like trail of menstrual blood here. <laughs> And I Instagrammed this photo in 2014 because I was just appalled and intrigued. And then I was just realizing, <laughs> actually, just today, I was like, oh, that's like the, um, like, you know, that's the moment my book began. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it would be nice to, to, like, share it with everybody who's on the Zoom. That's beautiful. I love to see that. Thanks, do you, do you guys think we should do some audience Q&A? Yes. So first, I wanted to ask one more question because I, I teased it. Um, so I was very pleased. I wanted to just talk one, like quickly about toilets um, and being a writer who's like thinking on the toilet and writing about the toilet and looking on the phone at the toilet, looking at the phone on the toilet. I was I was wondering from like page one, I'm like, is this going to be the book where I finally like hear about how the tampon can't stay in if you're if you're like doing anything else with your pelvic muscles? And I was very pleased to see that it was true. Um, I won't spoil it for anyone, um, but I think, you know, it's like every time I have my period, it's like a physical experience that I'm like, you know, I, I've, you know, you have the golden notebook period chapter, but right, from Doris Lessing, you have like the pooping chapter in Ulysses, like when is like the tampon getting squeezed out chapter gonna happen? Here it is. Um, and here it is. Thank God. <laughs> Culture's ready. Um, I mean, there, there is no experience that is, you know, too minor to, to go in this book. <laughs> I, I'm very pleased to see it. But um, did you, do you think a lot about the toilet and think on the toilet? Like, where did this come from? Because the very first line in the book is Dorothy is taking a shit in the library. Yeah. Um, and she's reading at the same time. Um, yeah, on her phone. On her phone, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, the where we bring our phones is really interesting to me, you know, like where we bring our phones, we bring them into bed, we bring them into the bathroom, we like, you know, I, I'm just kind of fascinated by that, like portability and how it colors the kinds of, I mean, I think we've all had this experience of like where you get an email affects everything about how you feel about it. Right. So if you get it in bed, you just like feel so much more vulnerable and exposed, or if like you're checking your email in the bathroom and then get like something that makes you feel weird it's going to make you feel twice as weird because they're like literally on the toilet yeah, um, yeah i mean i don't really i don't really have a good answer for this except that it just felt like something i needed to write about i definitely think the book is about waste like that word is really important to me and like a sort of like sense of like wasted potential like draft like drafting as a form of like waste and like the miscarriage as waste and then like excrement as waste and like all of these kinds of moments and you know it like begins with her like shitting in the library which is like this like place of knowledge and then it ends with her respectfully putting her students papers into the trash right and so it's like another sort of image of like throwing things away um, um. That's all. good answer yeah let's let's um Let's answer some questions, um, though I will add that uh, Rachel Ossett made a lovely comment, which is that the toilet is your book's sonogram. Oh, yeah. Um, very nice. Um, so I will answer this one. Um, an anonymous attendee says, I would love to hear about the different forms, how the different forms of criticism you've written and write 
academic, popular criticism informed your approach to this novel? Were you thinking as a critic as you wrote the novel? I mean, I feel like I'm always like just myself. Like, I don't know what other people are like if they feel like now I'm doing like this part of myself or now I'm doing that part of myself. But I feel like I'm just like always just completely doing me. I mean, there's like different like genre conventions or straight jackets or expectations, but I mean, I definitely think like, no, I wasn't really thinking like about forms of criticism, but I was thinking about just like reading and like what this character could get from reading, you know? And I, I knew that like, I knew that I always like it in books when people talk about other books. And so I wasn't afraid of like going into that really deeply. And I, I liked having a character who is an intellectual who could like have some thoughts about a Kafka story that she really cares about. That doesn't really answer the question. I mean, it does in the sense that you, it's, you kind of don't have much of a choice. Like, I yeah, think like, the critical element is operative. Yeah, I mean, one I question, always, that, yeah. One question might be like, I mean, you've written a lot of criticism by the time you started writing fiction. Mm -hmm. um, did it feel like a radically different thing you had to learn from scratch? Or did it feel like there were continuities for you? I think there were some continuities just again in terms of like being really used to reading really closely but I definitely have enjoyed like studying kind of technical things in a different way like you know like opening a book I really like and being like okay like what how do they get from here to there like you were talking about like interiority or like is th when does thinking get broken up by like something in the world you know and actually like trying to like kind of map it out in a more like structured way is interesting um we have another question um so I'm so curious about the character of Gaby who is a kind of foil or frenemy for Dorothy and who serves up a lot of complicated emotions I feel like I know people like her. The characterization felt so real and vivid to me. What were you thinking about as you created this character? <laughs> um, Gabby, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I liked, um, what was I thinking about as I created her? Well, I'm glad that she felt real and like someone that you know, because that, is good and you know she should feel real um it was important to me that gabby be cool you know and to to show that like dorothy had like some sort of like cool side to her and wasn't you know um wasn't just like some sort of like library dweller <laughs> i don't know i don't know how to answer that question i'm sorry well i mean she does show that she has friends um, she has people who care about her. Yeah. Like it does give you a sense of Dorothy as someone who has like a bigger life beyond these like 200 or 300 pages. Yeah, and you know, just like in the book, the, the people that are, the other characters in the book, you have her mother, her mother's sort of like surrogate daughter, who's a kind of like rival or double for Dorothy. You have Dorothy's best friend. Um, you have Dorothy's former mentor. You have Dorothy's like kind of two academic rivals. So there's just kind of like two therapists. They're just kind of like, X, there's like a lot of like extra people, but there's only one Gabby and there's only one Raj. Um, and so I think they are, there is a sense that those are like the really kind of like significant people because they're not being divided up into doubles. That's so interesting now considering the, the Alexandra story with the twins. Right, right. <laughs> I, I won't right. spoil it, it's good. Yeah. Um, okay, I've got another one. Um, so Claire Sostanovich asks, um, I'm so interested in this as a quote unquote therapy novel. How slash why did you quote decide if that's the right word to write one? Uh, are there other good ones out there? I don't know if there are other good ones out there, but if people have suggestions, I mean, I love therapy. I mean, I love reading about therapy. I love thinking about therapy. So I would, you know, I'm happy to, to hear what else I should read. Uh, the hard thing about the therapist was like keeping both of them along the way like it was suggested to me several times that I should really cut um, cut down to just having one therapist that like two <laughs> therapists risked making Dorothy sort of like cartoonish or unsympathetic 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think that like the feedback was really that at various points, the two therapists weren't working, right? And so I had to like do a lot of revision to make them work. But it was always really important to me that she had these like two therapists because it showed just the kind of like excess. It also showed her investment in like therapy itself and like this kind of like this is where we see that she actually does believe that things can get better and she hasn't totally given up <laughs> you know what I mean that she's like instead of just like quitting therapy she actually like seeks more therapy and I like there's a lot of stuff like between the lines I think about about the therapists um I lost I lost my train of thought there's one other thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, you you tweeted a lot before the novel came out about um, the the fact that people had galleys, oh, I know. which are uncorrected. Oh. Like they're the next, the just before the final stage of the of the book. Um, and you presumably, you, some people make very few changes. It sounded like you made some more significant ones. And as a reviewer, you were like hyper aware of, of this yeah. fact that people were writing their reviews just based on the galleys. But I wondered where your uh, where your feelings about that came from and if it changed your own feeling about reviewing. Yeah, well, I mean, it did. And it's just like, so in my case, I did just a lot of line editing of the galley, you know, and, um, and a lot of line editing of the galley. And I am definitely a, um, like a tweaker and a tinkerer and any magazine editors who have worked with me know to expect like just a lot of rewriting, you know, like you send me an edit that's like, Oh, can you address this one thing? And I'll just like rewrite the whole section and then I'll rewrite the whole next section. I just like love to rewrite. And um, I think it's often because I don't get it right the first time, you know, like Dorothy's relationship to drafting is my own relationship to drafting. I often have to write, it really garbage first draft that winds up just getting thrown away and then I can actually get down to work. And I often don't kind of get down to like seriously writing until kind of late in the game, right? So it'll be like kind of a late draft when I finally feel like things are kicking into gear. Um, all that said, you know, so I, of course I did a ton of line editing to the galley and then I just felt like a lot of embarrassment that people like were gonna read galleys when like it wasn't the finished book. And um, it just felt weird to me. And I was like, why do we even, why do we even do this? Like, because you know, the people who read the closest are the people, well, not necessarily, but in some cases are the people who have the galleys. And it's made me really question, like I'm reading a galley right now and I keep like toggling in my mind between being like, you know, this isn't finished and being like, well, I have to treat it like it's finished because it's the only thing that's in front of me, hmm. you know? Is there, a, is there a solution to the galley problem? I mean, I don't understand why we have them. I really don't. Like, why, why, why do we have them? Uh, to give uh, reviewers lead time, like enough time to read the book. And well, why, why can't we just print finished? Is the problem that you can't warehouse them? Why can't we print on demand finished books? And then the publisher doesn't actually print the real books until like two months later. Good question. I don't actually know. Like, it just seems audience. like the whole process could be, are there, Christine, it sounds like it's a real business opportunity here. I, I love where this is going. I mean, you were, you were really, you were, if we were talking about autofiction, it's clear that you were not Dorothy. Okay, so somebody <laughs> here says print on demand is more expensive. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's true. I just, I just find it, it, it seems to me a sign of like pub, the publishing industry's like hostility to like questions of style and literature because the attitude that everyone gave me was like, oh, it's fine. And I don't mean like my editor who I love or like, I don't mean like my press. I just mean like even people in the world would be like, oh, the galley is fine. Every, everybody knows it's not final. And I was like, why is this okay? Mm. Some level it's that we think that like the, the, the changes that the writer makes at the last minute are like all fine and good for the writer. But like, come on, we all know that like the, the with those final changes, it's it's a great it's either going to be a great book or it's not, you know. Right, so you're part of the problem. Right? <laughs> yeah, I really don't believe that. Like, I, either either you yeah, think the commas totally. matter or you don't. Like, I think that's that's the kind of. I mean, I desperately think they matter, like under the under the sign of eternity. But like, you there know. is no eternity. Okay. <laughs> all right. <Under laughs> there the isn't going to be an eternity. Like we have to. It has to matter right now. It has to. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Okay, is that enough? Thank for the bar. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, an another question, and sorry, thank you everybody for your questions, and I'm sorry if we can't get to them all. Um, I'm truly biased in my question selection. I wanted to ask this too, and I forgot. 
Um, so another person asks, I love the name Dorothy. I immediately thought of the Wizard of Oz, but it's also peculiar and a little out of place in the same way the character is. What were you thinking about when you settled on that name? What I wanted to ask is I only noticed the possible George Eliot reference when somebody calls her Dodo, um, which is both a joke about like, is she a Dodo, but is also the nickname that uh, Dorothea is given in Middlemarch. Um, but yes, can you talk about the name, Dorothy? Um, that was just the first name that came out. I mean, when I wrote this story, it just, the whole story just like came out all at once like that, more or less. And um, I just never was gonna change it because it was just like, this person is Dorothy. I don't know why that name was in my unconscious. But then yes, once I got to the scene and with Judith and everything, I thought it was like a kind of like a funny um, double meaning. Um, Gabby's name changed. Oh, what was it before? Gabby's name was Shannon for a long time. Huh, why Gabby? Um, I got a lot of feedback that people said that like Shannon just didn't work for them. Um, so I took their feedback. I think she's more of a Gabby. Mm -hmm. She gabs. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, okay, so I feel bad because I haven't been um, looking at the academia questions and I should, I should give the academia questions some airtime. Um, so Jesse Lawson asks, I like a moment where Dorothy is talking about being a custodian in the old system in academia, which persists but the new system hasn't arisen yet. I thought the idea that a new system in academia or outside it could arise was rather hopeful if fleeting in contrast to the emphasis on the apocalypse, failure, et cetera. In the novel, um, is there a real world conversation being invoked here about a new system? It's another way of asking, are you optimistic in any way about academia? Um, it's hard, I mean, it's hard to be optimistic given the adjunct crisis and what's happening with the pandemic and everything being on Zoom and people's like lectures being owned by university. Like it is kind of a little bit hard to be optimistic, although I am, you know, encouraged by certain things like the Columbia University graduate students are on strike. Everyone should support their strike fund, right? Like oh, can we um can we get a link to the strike fund? Yes, yeah. like that gives me hope. It's like Finally, I'm so amazed by those students and just like in awe of them and, um, you know, hope for the best outcome for them, although Columbia is not um, historically given me a great deal to feel hopeful about. Um, um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't, does the novel like take seriously the idea of a new future system? That's a really good question. Um, no, I see it more as a throwaway line. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I wonder uh, how much it is, a, like, the fact that there is n not a sense of a need for hope in the novel, that it, it, um, it has this amazing ending that I won't give away, but that um, is definitely about the, there not being endings, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and I wonder about, again, that's that the relationship there to kind of um, the problem of post-Christianity, mm -hmm. um, because it does kind of remind me of just the feeling like, okay, well, what is it that Baudelaire says? Like, you know, um, I know, I mean, Baudelaire says he'll believe in the devil after he believes in God. And like, we're past that. We're not, we're not believing in anything. There's kind of hopelessness. Um, and I think one of the things that's great about the novel is that it's willing to stay there. You know, it's not in taking, hopelessness. Yeah. Yeah. Although I do think, I think the ending is like a little bit lighter. Like, I think that we get to, I think there's been like a number of these kind of like minor epiphanies that for me do kind of build up to putting Dorothy in a different place. You know, like the, the puppet show, she cries with her advisor, which I think she's like, she like grieves, she like grieves for her career. Um, there's a, the end of the karaoke scene. I think she has a kind of moment of acceptance of her own kind of contingency or like how she's not really needed. You know, and even though that sounds like it's kind of hopeless, I actually think it's liberating. And then I, she's, there's a sort of, sort of episode of her like caring for someone else. And I think so all of that together, I see as like kind of justifying a slightly, I wouldn't call it like a hopeful note, but it's like, I see her being kind of like at peace at the end of the book, right? 
um, and kind of like at peace in this state of kind of like brokenness or failure or or like not not fulfillment or something like that. Are we supposed to end now? Is that what? Yeah, I think we're gonna wrap up in a second. Um, this might be like an unfair question to you, Christine, because it's a lot of um, pressure on you. But um, seeing various questions about academia and hopelessness, someone offers a very strong reading about um, the the place of academia being kind of hostile to life or just like not suited to kind of cultivate it. Um, but would you give it, what advice would you give to readers who find a lot of, uh, to recognize in Dorothy's situation, who may be feeling sort of similarly um, stunted or um, facing a cliff? People who are in grad school or people who in are- In graduate school, who are kind of in that um, drifty limbo where they're not sure there's a future in academia for them. Maybe someone who just finished a PhD and is now starting a postdoc, such as myself. <laughs> okay, here's what I have to say, and I'm stealing this from a friend um, who is very wise. And I think that because academia is like broken and no one knows what the future brings, anyone who's in it should just write about what they care about. You just do what you love. You should like not worry about pleasing your advisors, you should not worry about conforming to whatever the protocols of your subspecialty are, because like, why, right? You're not gonna get a job anyway, most likely. So you should just like write the thing you wanna write, like read the things you wanna read, like be weird if you wanna be weird, like don't be weird if you're not weird, you know? But like, I actually think that like in this like catastrophe, there might actually be some space for people to just like do what they want for as long as they can and then you know figure out what comes next after in terms of getting the degree do you still think it's important for people to get the degree i think it depends who you are it was always important to me and um you know my advisor nick dames who was wonderful um and i had like a talk because i was like not really sure if i wanted to finish i was never really sure like if i was gonna was i gonna go on the market wasn't i gonna blah 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 and he was just like you know like some people are like kind of haunted by not finishing and like you should finish if you can. And that was good advice for me. I'm really glad I did, but I can't presume to know what anyone else should do. That's good advice. Um, is there, before we wrap up, um, is there anything about this novel that you wanted to share with readers that you haven't had an opportunity to really talk about yet? I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has read it and who has bought it. And it's just like an incredible feeling to know that people are actually reading it. And just thank you very, very much. <laughs> cool. Charles, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I, it's been amazing um, watching Christine develop as a writer and a thinker, um, you know, at M plus one and other places. And so, you know, I feel this just so exciting to me when I first got the galley and when I, when I got the final copy. Um, and yeah, I, I want to encourage people to get the book from the N plus one bookshop. Um, encourage you to donate to N plus one. Oh yeah, can um, I say something about that? Just that, again, I cannot reiterate enough, this book would not exist if it weren't for M plus one. I would totally not have kept working on my short story. So everyone should really support M plus one because um, unexpected things happen. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, they, you know, Christine's one of our favorite writers and we, we, we've had other people we've supported a lot and I think there've been, you know, we have a list that we keep of books that you know, for a lot of, in a lot of ways happened because of the magazine and we are kind of a shoestring nonprofit. Um, I want to emphasize that people kind of think, oh, you know, you're, this is this big established magazine or something. And we really do survive on subscriptions to a shocking extent on donations, um, especially in the pandemic, like definitely took a toll. Um, so yeah, I don't want to go on about this, but it's, it would be a huge help. Just like, you know, we, we just like $5, things like that make a big difference. So buy the book, buy in plus one, subscribe, donate. That's it. Um, will this conversation be posted eventually? We hope so. We've been posting most um, recordings of our events on our website, I think also on a YouTube. So if you want to see um, past events, go to the online only section, of, like scroll down on the homepage and just click load more, load more, load more, and you'll be able to see um, recordings posted. So hopefully we will have one of this conversation 
as well. We may not have a written transcript, but um, you can send it to people and they can watch it. Um, okay. Christine, thank you so much for your beautiful book. Oh, um, thank you. And, you know, everyone in the audience, thank you so much for coming and for supporting Christine, supporting N plus one. Um, we'll see you on the flip. See you at the bar. See you at the bar. Bye. All right, bye everybody.